we will look at the uh, guide, uh, the Morem uh, Nuvuchim, uh, part one, chapter two, which is Maimonides' um, introduction uh, to the Garden of Eden. Um, but I want to say a couple of things before I begin, and just to give a little science of um, as background uh, or, or uh, foretaste of tonight, but also uh, as related to my talk last night. And that is that um, if <clears throat> uh, the whole issue of tradition, the whole issue of passing down of tradition, um, we think of the importance in cognition of feed forward loops. In other words, we know things, we remember them and we hand them down and that's an enormously important part of the way the brain and the mind work. Uh, so when we're talking, the second thing I just wanna touch on very slightly is the whole issue of symbolism. And the research shows that symbols are more salient in the mind than our you know, discourses, paragraphs, um, and that's very important. So when we do rituals that uh, highlight important things in our lives, they become salient to us. So pilgrimage, for example, is one of those. Uh, I think it's enormously important in our lives to have the symbol as well as the meaning. And um, the third thing I wanna talk about, just mention slightly, and this I will emphasize a lot tonight, is the whole issue, and this was what my book was essentially about, the issue of agency. In other words, who does an action, right? And there's a whole literature now on what we call extended agency, which is that there are neural maps that integrate the things that we use into the self map. So for example, when I use my phone, which is off, <laughs> um, it, in a way it becomes part of the extension of me and of my, I always think of my car, right? Because you almost feel like you're part of the same thing. Uh, so that's extended agency. And then we have distributed agency. And that is what we do together as a group. And that it becomes almost the whole group does the action. And Spinoza anticipates with his notion of the group mind. And that's something I'll talk about tonight. <laughs> so those are, that's a little horse spice of some things I'll mention. But um, uh, I'm, I'm very focused now because of the pilgrimage book, which is a book really on <clears throat> remaking American civil religion. In other words, trying to support democracy and pluralism through more uh, symbolic action uh, in America. And so I give my story, as you heard last night, in, in support of that. But I am focused on the, on the neuroscience for poets that supports that now. But tonight I'll talk more about um, the Holocaust and why people do good things, why people do bad things, and how to get them to do better things a little bit, at least from my perspective. But um, what I'm gonna talk about today, and I'm gonna give you an introduction to uh, the guide text. Uh, sorry, my, my eyes, uh, I should be, according to my ophthalmologist, I should be putting more. <laughs> Uh, wet things in my eyes. But anyway, um, I'm going to talk um, today about how, what Rambam, what Maimonides, how he regarded scientists. Um, and I have to remember that in, in the history of philosophy and science, philosophy and science were one until the 19th century and mid 19th century. So, oh, sure. Can you see me? Actually, I'm so short. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to stand? No, okay. No. All right. Um, <clears throat> Maimonides. Um, oh, thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> I was Jewish chaplain at Wellesley for three years while I was in graduate school. And then actually I was Jewish chaplain at Hamilton College for 10 years. Um, uh, while I had my, you know, they said, couldn't you just do the Jewish chaplaincy as well as be a professor? And I did. And um and I was always, there were always raised things. Um, <laughs> Maimonides regarded scientists and philosophers as the height of humanity. And he believed very, very much that there was a transformation of human character towards the good, towards benevolence um, through the understanding of nature 
uh, in, in a rigorous scientific way. And the question is, you know, we don't usually think that way. We have a, a different uh, modernity, uh, but how can we recapture that? And um, why would he think so? So um, the, the text we're gonna read today is his assessment of the importance of the scientific life for a human being as the ideal life. And then later tonight, um, we'll give some of the Spinoza's psychology of that and why, how Spinoza plays that out, that it is a life of the love of the universe. Um, and people have thought of this as, there's a whole movement of deep ecology that comes out of this uh, and, it, and it relies on Spinoza. But first let's look at Maimonides because Maimonides is the great inspiration for uh, Spinoza and really articulates this principle uh, perhaps best in the history of philosophy. So let me give you a little introduction to the Maimonidean text. And this is an esoteric text. And um, <laughs> that means that people can fight about it in dissertations for you know millennia. <laughs> um, and so Maimonides is in part hiding what he says by contradicting it sometimes and by uh, throwing the different uh, arguments all over the text <laughs> so that you have to collect them. So it's a very engaged reading. You can't just read it and know what it says. And also he makes the, uh, the point that if he says it less, he means it more. <laughs> and if he says it more, he means it less. So it's a very challenging text and a very interesting one. Um, and uh, let's, let's go here. <clears throat> Yosef Yerushalmi alerts us, and especially Jews, to the difference between history and memory. And he warns us against confusing the two in his great short reflection on being a historian, Zachor, Jewish history and Jewish memory. Nevertheless, the edge between them is perhaps not as sharply defined as he had hoped. For the very existence of history depends on group memory and memorialization and enactment, which are the very subject of historical analysis, for they create the group as a historical subject. And it gets messier because the history the historians write can become part of the history the group lives by. And it, um, <clears throat> that is what Yerushalmi is warning us about, not that we should avoid the history of the historians, but that we lay people often mistake our stories for history itself. But what if we correct and revise our stories, even our story of origin, in the light of the history of the historians? For example, archeologists looking at the data underground in both Israel and Egypt, some of them important ones, especially out of Tel Aviv, now doubt that there was, there was an Israelite exodus from Egypt. Can we still be Jews without believing that the Israelites sojourn in slavery in Egypt and the exodus actually happened? Can we, um, <clears throat> uh, perhaps we could take a step backward and think of ourselves not as the community who remembers and retells and revives the exodus of our ancestors in Egypt, but instead as those in, who inherit a made up exodus story as the defining meaning of who we are. Perhaps we can rethink the Torah and ourselves in the light of the discoveries of the archeologists and historians. The result of rigorous scientific archeological methods and historical understandings from those and other data on the other hand, and on the, on the other hand, the world of the imagination do not need to be cleanly separated that liberal Jewish congregations routinely invite Jewish historians and other scholars to lecture and conduct weekend workshops with congregants speaks to the accepted integration of history and science into memory. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> the introduction of revised historical understandings and relevant scientific discoveries into the domain of collective retelling and ritual enactment both intended to foster Jewish identification makes possible the ongoing transformation of both the community and the text. Text and community and also science 
social and natural, are in dynamic relationship. Maimonides in the 12th century struggled with just exactly this very dilemma. We have not invented it. <laughs> by, um, posed by the modernity of his own day, namely for the rigorous philosophical and, and, and rational methods and scientific explanations of Aristotle challenged the reading and understanding of the biblical story. He developed a detailed and deeply thought out answer to how to come to terms with this <laughs> rational challenge to tradition. Maimonides devoted his great philosophic opus, The Guide for the Perplexed, to reinterpreting the biblical text in the light of the science and revised moral uh, principles or moral psychology and understandings of the philosophy and science of his day. So we don't have to be Aristotelians to read this. We can, we can transpose his solution to today. The new rational understandings could be rendered imaginatively and read back into the Bible in order to teach the rudiments of science and philosophy to the general Jewish public, uh, which I'll go into. In addition to rational politics, I'm sorry, I think I skipped something. Um, Okay, uh, the Isra I'm gonna read the sentence again. The Israelite story he held could and should be transformed in imagination to mean what the truths of reason and science had independently discovered and revealed. He thought the Bible could be used to give the general public a more rational uh, myth. Okay. All right. In addition, a rational politics and revised moral principles could be envisioned and also read back into the text. Maimonides realized that every community at heart and at origin is what we call today an imagined community. All communities are established and preserved on the shaky foundations of rhetoric and story, invented rules and institutions. And Maimonides in the history of philosophy has the most rigorous conception that morals are created by the community. Okay, isn't that interesting for someone reading the biblical text and the Ten Commandments? Okay, that's it. Although he says that human nature is not invented, but both uh, understood through science and um, conventionalized in rules. Can you give us a framework what time period we're talking about? Oh, of course. Um, Maimonides lives from 11, I think 1135 to 1205? 38. 38, sorry. Yeah. We have the document that verifies the translation or verification of 1168. Oh, it's my birthday. Ah, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> You know the the little biograph, the little um, letter that he wrote to uh, Ibn Tibon, and right, which is right. He says, "I'm so busy." Like anyway, never mind. <laughs> and he describes his day, which is an, um, <laughs> sort of like our days. You know? <laughs> all right, um, all right. The, their truth, the truth of communities, lies not in their origin, which he believed was imagined and conventional but instead how they incorporate and incorporated and applied scientific and moral and political content and virtue. Their content had to be evaluated independently by rational standards of proof. So the test of the Bible is not the Bible. The test of the Bible is philosophic and scientific argument and uh, discovery and truth. Hence, truth could be derived and established only via the application of scientific method as the test of validity. Truth was divided into two kinds. First, the truths of nature, about nature writ, nature writ large and those about the human species. And second, those derived from these fundamental truths of nature and human nature and applied conventionally and imaginatively to political systems in the interest of human justice and perpetuation. One truth of human nation, nature was that the mind has two components, a rational capacity 
and an imaginative capacity. And when he said the imaginative capacity, he put everything else but uh, sort of the highest cognitive reason in there. Uh, so the imaginative capacity uh, encompassed all the various mental processes outside of reason, like emotions, uh, motivations, sensations, uh, as well as envisioning non-present images, putting images together and remembering them. And all kinds of social processes, political, all of that, religious, he thought was religion was an imaginative phenomenon invented by human beings. I mean, he's very radical, right? Uh, the dual character of the human biological constitution as both rational and imaginative had to be accommodated to, to promote justice and ethics. There was no getting around this and the Torah Maimonides insisted did just that. Its core truths he believed were rational, but conveyed and institutionalized in imaginative form, in narratives and in social community and laws. It established a rationally defensible legal system and tradition and political institutions, yet translated these for the general public into the imaginative forms of persuasive stories and rules appealing to divine authority to what Maimonides regarded as the fiction of an anthropomorphic divine ruler. Uh, Maimonides' God is the God of science, the God, the deist God in, in American terms, uh, the deist God who puts the whole, who's the God of nature and puts nature into its patterns of regular patterns, but not the God of intervention as, as a person. The image of a fatherly divine ruler was the stuff of fiction, he said, stories for the simplest of folk, but nevertheless necessary to ensure order and civic justice. The crucial and central question for every society, Maimonides was believed, was how to use the imagination, story, ritual, history, rhetoric, laws and rules, um, force, ceremony and spectacle, and some coercion as well as persuasion to ensure both its own long-term survival and also its commitment to justice. Jewish society, he argued, had the best and perfect answer uh, to this problem, and that was the Torah. For it appealed to the heart while being based upon the rational mind. Uh, reason alone, however, was too fragile a social foundation to ensure so societal survival and justice. The Torah applied rational understandings about human nature derived independently from science and philosophy to society in the interest of, uh, in the interest of justice and survival. And Maimonides insisted the Torah even embedded some oblique discoveries of the natural sciences, you know, granted of its day, but still you get the principle into the stories of the Bible for those who could unpack them and, un and understand that they were more, that the Bible is metaphorical and has science in metaphorical form. It's, so it's um, popular science for the general public. Thus giving the general public a window into a scientific naturalist worldview and dampening their superstitious tendencies. So he had this tremendous uh, I would say understanding, but certainly commitment that for to have political justice and a rational society as much as possible, one had to have a naturalistic worldview and convey that not only to the intellectual elite, but to the general public. I think he's prescient in this. I think it is absolutely a very important Point. Can I ask a question? Sure. What about the non-Jew and his philosophy? Yes, yes. Well, of course, you know, they were a minority community and oppressed. So, uh, well, somewhat oppressed. Um, <clears throat> he thought that the uh, um, Muslim community in, in which he lived, of course, first uh, in Cordova and then in Cairo, and he was the uh, physician to the caliph, mm -hmm. um, he thought that they didn't do it as well, that the Torah did it. Uh, so the Torah, he thought it was the great example um, <clears throat> for all mankind, and it was rational in a way that the uh, Quran uh, was not. 
On the other hand, he had unfortunately very nasty things to say about uh, some rabbinic <laughs> uh, scholars yes. whom he thought were much too um, narrow in their viewpoint. So these, this was a he universal was, idea. He didn't that, like Christians that much either. No, he didn't like Christians either. <laughs> and he really didn't That's like really black didn't people, like. I'm sorry. Yeah. And he didn't like women, although he, he's oh. more ambivalent about women. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he's, he's the 12th century, you know, if, if we dismiss him, then we have to dismiss everybody and, mm -hmm. you know, we do the best we can, right? Okay. He believed in the God of science. He believed in the God of nature, that God is behind the natural processes. Yeah, so he would be, to get ahead of the rabbi, he would be probably an atheist in the use of the term God in 2023 by most people in the United States. To be a deist or to be something like that. Right, he would be a sort of deist. And later, um, you know, I'm gonna talk about Spinoza because Spinoza pushes Maimonides to the end, right? And Spino what Spinoza does in terms of theology, if you wanna call it that, is that Spinoza takes off the top and says, nature is God, God is nature. So you don't have, here you have the supernal God as the source of nature and beyond nature, giving rise to nature as the expression of God. But in Spinoza, you only have the expression, you don't have the God behind it. But I would, I would argue, sorry. In, yeah, so argue, would, yeah. argue, in 2024 would not be an atheist, called an atheist because he had a very rigorous Jewish ritual and, and communal and lawful life. Absolutely. He lived at, as a Jew, and just because some Jew in the pews had a what he would say is a simple notion of God and living the same life as Maimonides, he would say they still have to live the same life following the law. Yeah, but he doesn't believe in the God that intervenes in your personal life or intervenes right. in history or intervenes. Correct. That's but he, true. But That's he would true. still say the prayers every day asking for healing and yes. still say the prayers every day asking for redemption and still say, you know. And not only said them, but totally wrote, right. wrote, right, wrote extensively on how rational they are. Yeah. Right? Can I ask another question? Yeah. So is the persona, the God personified, you know, like the, the guy with the beard and skin, did that rise out of the attempts to make religion appeal to the people who used to believe in the, you know, the pagan, the whatever, the no, Greek gods, the, the, right. the what pantheon? It does, right, what it did, I mean, I think his motivation, I mean, part of it is I think he thought it was true, what he was saying, but I think also he was trying to get the elite scientists of his day, mm -hmm. Jewish scientists, not to leave the fold. Yeah. I mean, it's a it's kind of like the reform movement. It's you know, at least when I grew up in the reform movement, that was you know, you don't you you want people to and to revise it in terms of it. But I think he was profoundly committed to it. I think he was profoundly committed to a. I mean, he he was a philosopher and he was profoundly committed to uh, this worldview and profoundly committed to Judaism. He was a leader uh, of the community. He was you know he he writes. Uh, uh, he tries to, you know, uh, supplant the Talmud, right? <laughs> so, I mean, he's profoundly committed to the community. Um, and But we have to understand another aspect of it, and that is, you know, he's writing in couched form. I mean, the guide is not for everybody. It's uh, And the, the fiction is that he's only writing it for one person, Rabbi Joseph, mm -hmm. uh, his student, who's like 35 and knows all. And he says, why is it called perplexed, right? Uh, he writes it for one person. He says, I'm, not, I'm only writing this down because you're not here and I can't talk to you because I'm really supposed to do this orally, but I'll do it in writing. And that's the fiction. Um, and uh, right, so so he wants, he wants very much to obey and to follow and also to transform. And so how does he do this? I mean, it's 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 a fascinating thing how he does this, and he tries to do both at once. You yeah. use the phrase. Oh. Yeah, go mm -hmm. ahead. You use the phrase rational myth a little while ago, and isn't that what he's pushing in a way? Yes, I mean, what he's trying to push is, I wouldn't say, maybe I used that wrong, but I would say that he's trying to put rational truths in mythic form, yeah. right? And re and but also he believes in the Torah language that the language of Torah is 
is imaginative. In fact, all language is imaginative, according to Maimonides, which is so interesting. All language, in other words, is conventional. And the Torah, Torah uh, Adam. Even the rabbis say Torah spoke in the language of human beings, right? But he believes he believes that the status of the Torah is deeply true in the sense of its content, but in imaginative form. Okay. What you kind of said in the preface, I wanted to ask you when you talk about symbols. Yeah. Is he trying to provide a symbol? Um, in our terms. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I think he. I mean, he's he understands the necessity for political society, and that's what we, oops, that's exactly what we're going to read about now, right? In the in Genesis, he believes that it, it is absolutely <laughs> vital that human beings turn to symbolic uh, ritual, symbolic action, uh, imaginative story to ground ethics in society yeah. in institutions. That morphing to idolatry sometimes. Mm -hmm. That's another story. <laughs> not my story. Not. Not story. Yeah, it, but right, right, right. I, I'm not up on my monodies on idolatry. Maybe someone is. This is my thing. Okay, so, but he does, um, and we don't, Spinoza, I'll, I'll go to Spinoza for one second here. And that is Spinoza who follows him and uses his method of rhetoric, rhetorical rhetoric in the um, TTP and the Tractatus Theological Politicus says, we don't want to make an idea an idol of the biblical text, uh, the and um, of pages and of letters, we want to understand it. So Maimonides, I mean, I'm sorry, Spinoza goes there, and of course Plato went there in the Phaedrus. Okay, does that? Yeah, go ahead. I'm yeah. sorry. Because God is not just the result of an imaginative mind; God is the result of reason as well. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Maimonides is absolutely committed to uh, to the the supernal nature of God. And we can only, when we, he talks about science, he says we can only know things under the moon, he says. So what do we mean by under the moon? In other words, we, we can understand the earth, we can understand our part of the universe, but God is not just the God of this little corner. God is the God. And so God is in some sense total, uh, he, he emphasizes the unknowability of God as well. There we go. And by my actions. And Maimonides talks about the attributes of actions. And the attributes of actions are science. In other words, what does God do? God does science, right? God does nature. And Spinoza comes right out of, okay. So, so, but if God does nature and does science, then why the need for the semiotics and symbols, right? Like you can construct a whole set of ethical teachings, right? Uh, without the without the without the stories, like just to scroll down, like a you know, like, like a mighty stream. Right, like right. You, don't, you don't need a biblical story to say that, right? And that is the introduction to Genesis. I mean, to the Genesis interpretation, <laughs> to the Adam and Eve, because that's exactly where that comes in. Okay. And the and for Maimonides, who's an Aristotelian, and this is not the reason Spinoza gives. But for Maimonides, who is an Aristotelian, we are matter and soul, right? We are mind and body. And so it's, Maimonides will say it's because we're embodied. Body demands, because body is not completely um, uh, uh, amenable to complete rational. <clears throat> and so the imagination, and he'll tell us, uh, Maimonides tell, tells us, that and this is this is a counterintuitive. The imagination is a um, is a feature is a uh, what's the word um, of the body. Now we don't think of the imagination as part of our body, but he thinks he thinks it's a part of the body. And actually, my mom, uh, Spinoza follows him in that, mm -hmm. and we have to get into that because they really have a sense in a way of the unconscious and of the embodied unconscious. And the embodied unconscious is part of the body. So rather than, it, it's sort of like reason is here and everything else that we think of as cognitive, but not rational cognitive is part of the body. 
Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. And that's what happens in the story because uh, in the story, um, Adam, right, um, is, is um, uh, tempted by his imagination, right? Mm -hmm. And he's embodied. And therefore you have to deal with that in human beings. You cannot have just reason uh, because reason may be okay for certain elite people who are capable of that kind of living, uh, but not for everyone. And for Spinoza, Spinoza says everyone is, everyone is the same. And anyone who gets in a state of, uh, of need and of fear and of sickness, you know, it's hard to be rational. Right? I'm sorry. Thousands venture to say that most people in our society place the rational above the embodied experience. Yes. Is she a Jew that way, or are they both yes. equally valid? Um, no. Um, no. Um, <clears throat> for, for Spinoza, they're equal because <clears throat> the, the body and mind are one, in some sense. For Maimonides, no. For Maimonides, and that's what we'll read about in a minute. Um, Adam was completely rational. He was the greatest philosopher, uh, the greatest philosopher of all time. He taught Plato philosophy, <laughs> okay, and science. But you know, then he discovered he had a body, and he uh, was tempted by it, and he became a regular person. And um, but okay, he became a regular person and um, had to deal with the imagination then, and that was his. Um, uh, exit from Eden into the normal world, and then became, but uh, uh, he became, so he had to leave philosophy and science, which were his great activity of joy and transcendence, uh, but he had to leave them behind, he and Eve, and go out into the world, and he had to become political, <laughs> and he had to use the imagination, he had to perfect the imagination, uh, and have it uh, transformed through reason, and that's when you get Moses. Moses becomes the greatest philosopher ever to hit the world who understands that you have to be a prophet. And to be a prophet means to use the imagination in the service of reason. Okay, so that answers your question, and that's the Torah. The Torah is greater than philosophy because it translates philosophy of Plato, whom he whom he gave philosophy to, and it translates it into political society and popular science, and mm -hmm. that's the Torah. So prophets are greater than philosophers, even though we all wish we were philosophers and scientists who can spend our life only looking up at the mm -hmm. stars and having this incredible joy, transformative joy of Torah lishma in terms of philosophy and science, but we have to come down because we've got a world. We've got a world that we have to deal with. And so prophets use the imagination in the interest of, in the interest of community and bringing science to the community, their teachers and political leaders, whereas philosopher scientists go off somewhere and just create. <laughs> Okay, I've given you the whole story. <laughs> and that's, isn't it interesting? I mean, I think it's a fascinating story. And when I was in graduate school, many, many years ago, um, you know, we, we thought, okay, this is a fiction. The Bible couldn't possibly mean this. And of course, Maimonides, I mean, Spinoza, who learned so much from Ramba and is inspired by him, comes along and says, hey, guys, you know, the Bible couldn't mean this. It can't possibly mean this. And of course, that's true. We don't read the Bible that way. We, and Spinoza is one of the inventors of modern biblical scholarship. And he says, you have to read. It's utterly empirical. You have to read what's in the text. You have to understand its historical context as well as you can. You have to understand the cognate languages. And then you come up with what it's actually saying. So it can't possibly mean science. It can't possibly mean Aristotle. Um, so he critiques Maimonides on this. And of course, we agree with him as modern <laughs> biblical scholars. On the other hand, I want to reclaim Maimonides on this because I think that Maimonides was absolutely on target when he says that we need symbolic action to support science and a more naturalistic outlook 
for democracy. I mean, my mother doesn't do it for democracy. Spinoza does it for democracy. I think he's right. I think we we can't just leave science to scientists, but we have to make it a communal activity to understand uh, the world in a more naturalistic way. And in fact, I'm I'm very enheartened uh, because if you turn on the TV right now, everything is the eclipse, right? I mean. Maimonides would be very happy, <laughs> right? Enormously happy. Spinoza would be happy because here's a community of, of people all over running to understand this phenomenon, to see it, to experience it, and then to have some kind of access in lay people terms to its scientific meaning and its naturalistic outlook. I mean, we're not, you know, we are not... Um, Yankees, right? <laughs> Connecticut Yankees. And, we were talking about this yesterday. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We're not, you know, we're not pretending that this is, uh, you know, some kind of magical thing and that the, a dictator could, uh, you know, be magical enough to control uh, the sun and the moon, right? So I think Maimonides would, would be heartened by this as Spinoza would. And, and yet, I would say yes. in American society, though, I would... Certain parts of like the wellness culture yes. are exactly anti-science and anti. Uh, yes. You know, you can control. Yes. You know, your thoughts can control uh, your success and your health and all yes. of that, right? So that is a huge part of our. Culture. Absolutely, and that's exactly why we need this. And that I talk about that in my book actually, because I think the whole idea that our our thoughts can control reality is is I mean, this kind of magical thinking is enormously dangerous. And, um, and a huge part of our political culture. Exactly, exactly. So, I mean, it, you know, uh, Maimonides and Spinoza would both say human nature hasn't changed. Uh, other things have changed. Do you have a question over there? Oh, sure. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So in, in a discussion of cognitive psychology, there's an examination of the interaction between thought, feeling, and action. I'm curious what Maimonides and Spinoza, with their schemas, yes. would say about those yes. interactions. Yes, actually, it's very interesting. And and um, I'll give you Spinoza because Maimonides doesn't address that in exactly that way, but he implied. Spinoza is very interesting that way um, because because Spinoza thinks that in order to change action, you have to change one's complete understanding. So he goes deep into the, uh, um, that's why he begins the ethics with metaphysics. Like, you know, this is a book called The Ethics, right? But he doesn't begin with what we would call ethics, you know, like uh, do this, don't do that, uh, be nice to people, blah, blah, blah. No, he begins with, God, right? He begins with the universe and nature. God is nature. It's like, you know, people today, especially in my field, uh, philosophical ethics, they'll say, that's a silly place to begin. He couldn't possibly mean ethics by it, but he does. And in fact, um, he thinks all virtue is intellectual virtue. And I'll talk about that tonight. In other words, honesty and self uh, uh, self-reflection on one's own origins and one's own origins of one's feelings of emotions of of one's culture that is where you begin because that's what you change to change desire and i call it the education of desire in other words it's not about learning rules it is about transforming one's basic motivations um, so that one has honesty in one's cognition okay and I'll talk about that mm -hmm. later. So I think he was, and he says of himself in uh, the introduction to part three of the ethics, I am writing the first scientific psychology. Don't listen to that Descartes with that mind body, can't hold together, nonsense. And then the moralism of Descartes because moral, Descartes comes out with the theory that you have mind and body in perpetual uh, 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 war and you better get your mind to control that body. And and Spinoza says, ain't ain't possible. <laughs> um, not to go too deeply into yeah. down the rabbit hole, but how much do you uh, feel the 
the technology of transfer from thought to to communication, whether it's being able to write, being able to write and, yes. and have it distributed the way yes, Sauron yes. Has, was, and then how that is continually evolving and what we're yes. seeing is like a yes. skyrocketing right now with the way yes. these things are communicated. Yes. Electronically and yes. TikTok. Yes. <laughs> how much does that play into this whole dynamic? Yeah. It's a move, you know, it's, it's yeah. a moving target. Right, and that's um, extended cognition, right? Extended, in other words, mm -hmm. all these things we extend. To, right. Um, what would Spinoza and Maimonides? I, I, they, I don't think they couldn't even, you know, <laughs> envision this. You know, it's, um, it's so tremendously powerful. It's so both wonderful mm -hmm. and terribly scary. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, you know more about it than I do. Thought from, from a thought to a, yeah. to a voice. And then from voice to a written page, right? And now we're we're going. Right. Through the, the well, I think we could bring in the imagination and say that we need to, uh, we need to have some kind of cultural, maybe stories, some kind of cultural, not only rules and laws, which were you know which are, they're trying to do that, or people talk about that, but also what about the cultural meaning of these things, and can we say something about how we use these things in terms of of um, cultural stories that we tell ourselves. I mean, it's happened so fast. Um, I had, I was, all right, I was married to a child of Holocaust survivors, which, um, and um, he lived 10 years with the Navajo, okay? And they would deal with those kinds of things. They would bring up those issues in community. Um, and he would be, he would hear from Navajos how surprised they were about white people that we don't, you know, think of how to ritually integrate it, how to symbolically integrate it into some cultural meaning and rules. So I, I think that they had, I think that was prescient. And certainly Maimonides or Spinoza would agree with that. And Spinoza follows Maimonides on the whole. And in fact, that's what happens, you see, between part three and part four of the ethics, and there are five parts, um, all hell breaks loose in Holland. And um, there's a there's a, a massive war, and France is invading, and um, and there's a turn. You know, Holland was the most liberal in Europe, right? And there's a turn towards fat, what we would call fascism or authoritarianism. And Spinoza takes five years off because he's so incredibly worried about this, and to intervene and try to write his own guide, so to speak, on politics and religion to create a kind of civil religion so that it will dampen uh, the most uh, authoritarian feelings and stories and um, and uh, authorities and and um, support democracy, pluralism, freedom of speech, freedom of conscience. Five years he takes. And that's like his guide. I mean, that is the moment in which he says, look, we have to do something for the general public because of this absolute crisis mm -hmm. and see if we can support in imaginative terms. Uh, and he uses the Bible for this. How can we support, how can we read the Bible and look at the Bible to support democracy and freedom? And he rereads the biblical text in ancient Israel, and I think in very good terms, and says, look, we've got a budding democracy there. And this could inspire all of us because after all, Holland was, Jews, Catholics, and various Protestants. Does that answer the question? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that was his crisis. Of course, what happens is he, it becomes the most vilified book in the history of philosophy. Has ever been a failure of the purpose? Totally, totally. I mean, he was completely naive. Get rid of the idea that he everybody. That he wasn't, exactly. Totally, totally. And he becomes the most vilified philosopher in history. And he's not revived. I mean, it, it, I mean, even the, the Enlighteners, right, the Enlightenment, Voltaire, you know, <laughs> etc. They loathe him. They, we're not him. We're not him. That Jew, that's, you know, even though Spinoza was excommunicated at the age of 24, he's right. <laughs> that Jew. So it right exactly it totally fails and I think he was naive about um, fanaticism. His his signet ring was caute, right? Caution and when he meant by caution was you got to be watch out what you said to say to people. 
He didn't listen. Do <laughs> <laughs> we get to the text? Okay. Um, all right. Sorry. <laughs> all right. I just want to um, point out to you before we get to the um, to the Maimonides text. I would just want to you to remind you of exactly some words in the biblical text. Okay. We have them open the. I'll just yeah. read the two right. verses. Sure. Okay. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed, and out of the ground made, made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree, and this is the important part for Maimonides, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's not the tree of knowledge. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and that's going to be the key for Maimonides, right? Okay, because, all right, that's the distinction. So let's look at the um, guide uh, one, two. Years ago, a learned man propounded as a challenge to me a curious objection. It behooves us now to consider this objection and our reply invalidating it. However, before mentioning this objection and its invalidation, I shall make the following statement. And again, this is one of the things that Maimonides slips in, and then we have to remember it later. Every Hebrew knew that the term Elohim, right? That's the word for God, one of the words, is equivocal. In other words, has numbers of meaning, designating the deity, okay, the angels and rulers governing cities. Mm. That's the key, right? Because you're going to be like Elohim at the end, but you're going to be like rulers, Okay. All right. There's one place in the in the biblical text where that uh, you have to translate it that way. Onkelos the proselyte, that's the Aramaic translation of the Bible, has made it clear, and his clarification is cl correct, that in the dictum of Scripture, and ye shall be as Elohim, knowing good and evil. The last sentence, the last sense is intended. In other words, when it says. At the end, uh, that you shall be, uh, that knowing good and evil, you shall be like what we would say gods or angels or divine. Really, what the text means is you're going to have to become rulers. Poor Adam is going to have to become like a ruler because he can't be a scientist anymore because he has discovered the body. He has discovered uh, human his humanity and not just his angelicalness. And he discovered he, society? He's or? discovered society. Exactly. He's discovered society because the body is also the social body for Maimonides and for actually Al-Farabi for the Arabic philosophic tradition, for the political tradition. He has discovered the social body and the social body needs rulers, right? Mm -hmm. So when it says ye shall be like Elohim, it's unfortunately you're going to have to use your imagination and be like a ruler. Okay, so that gives us the whole thing. And thus, having set forth the equivocality of this term, we shall begin to ex expound the objection. This is what the objector said. It is manifest from the clear sense of the biblical text. This is, and you have to realize, this is, this is the person challenging Maimonides, who's speaking now, mm -hmm. that the primary purpose with regard to man was that he should be, like the other animals, devoid of intellect and thought, and the capacity to distinguish between good and evil. And so, in other words, this objector is saying, look, you have this story. Uh, he's not a Jew, this, this is not an Israelite, this objector. Your story says that we should all be dumb like animals because after all, the punishment of Adam is that he comes to know good, <laughs> good and evil, uh, knowledge of good and evil. So obviously knowledge is terrible. Knowledge is what you don't want. You want to be dumb like the beasts. And this gets in Maimonides craw. Mm -hmm. This is the worst thing. Mm -hmm. And so he invents this objector to object to this. He says, wait a minute. Okay. Mm -hmm. However, when he disobeyed, the disobedience procured him as its necessary consequence, the great, the greatest perfection peculiar to man. Namely, his being endowed with the capacity that exists in us to make this distinction. In other words, he gets a mind. He gets an intellect. Oh, no, Maimonides will say. Now, this capacity is the noblest of the characteristics that exists in us. It's reason. It is in virtue of this 
of it that we are constituted as substances. Now it is a thing that he, now it is a thing to be wondered at that man's punishment for disobedience should consist in his being granted a perfection that he did not possess before, namely the intellect. So this is this is the challenge to Maimonides. Hear now the intent of our reply. We said, oh, you who engage in theoretical speculation using the first notion, you idiot who doesn't know philosophy and you know, just off the top of your head makes these claims. For the intellect below, for the intellect that God made overflow onto man and that is the latter's ultimate perfection was that which Adam had pro been provided with before he disobeyed. In other words, Adam was a perfect mind. It was because of this that it was said of him that he was created in the image of God and in his likeness. It's Adam's reason, his perfection of reason that makes him like God. It was likewise on account of it that he was addressed by God and, uh, and given commandments, okay? For commandments are not given to beasts and beings devoid of intellect through the intellect. When, now, this is one of the most important sentences in all of Rambam. Through the intellect, one distinguishes between truth and falsehood. And that was found in Adam in its perfection and integrity. In other words, Adam was the most perfect philosopher scientist of all time. He is investigating the universe to know and to discover its laws and its truths. And this is the point. Fine and bad, on the other hand, belong to the things generally accepted as known, not to the intellect. Mm -hmm. okay. In other words, this has been uh, the great scholar Shlomo Pines has written about this. Maimonides was the most extreme in the history of philosophy to distinguish between moral truths or moral beliefs and scientific naturalist beliefs. And he put as absolutely supernal the truths of science, the truths of nature, the transformation of the human personality in the discovery of those and the engagement in truth, in the discovery of knowledge and science and nature and convention is something we have to live with. And he says, um, uh, nature enters into it, truths enter into it, re reason enters into it, because there are truths of human nature, there are discoveries about the human nature, and then we construct conventions in the light of those, but they are not the same, and the, um, the distinction is absolutely extreme, and it is, a, it is Adam's fall that he has to go from the life of the mind, lishma in in science, to the life of the leader and the Torah uh, so, creator. So the, the Torah. Yeah. So then, living a life of Jewish law, as my mind spells yes. out, is the lower is lower part is the distinguishing between good and as they say, fine and bad. Yes. But it leads you to hints of knowing the truth. Is that, Absolutely, is that, I, and and that was that was um, Moses's greatness that he put in the truths of science yes, and a scientific did. outlook. He put um, hints of it right. all over the Hebrew text, and, and so all that, over the Bible. And so the tree of, of knowledge of good and evil is is a myth of coming down into regular humanity rather than exalted humanity. Exactly. Okay. But then Maimonides switches a little bit because he says the prophets are greater than the philosophers, scientists, because prophets lead and in the name and, and they, understand they, they, science and then apply it to human society. So a and philosopher doesn't live in community. A philosopher is, is up often there. caved by themselves. Exactly. And, exactly. Yeah. So Maimonides as ambivalent. It's only in the, in you know the life in the the life to come, let's say that one can be a real one can truly be a scientist. Whereas in this life, one must be become a prophet or be a prophet. And of course, Maimonides himself is that prophet kind of person because he's a leader. And when we understand what he does every day, he goes to the court 
he goes to the caliph's court and he sees all the patients there because he's a doctor. And he comes home and then he sees all the patients in the Jewish community. And then he has a little bit of a supper. And then, you know, sometime around midnight, maybe he gets to write a little bit. So it's, he wishes he could lead the life of the mind and of the scientist, but he has a commitment to the community. And he, re, he tries to rewrite rabbinic law uh, and, and philosophy uh, and to so that the community will benefit from it because we live after writing the guy spent the rest of his life writing medical books. Yeah. 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 But he, yeah. Yeah. but he also wrote he also wrote letters telling people how to follow Jewish law, like how to yeah. live yeah. in your situation. Yeah. 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 You're still a leader of the community, but right. yeah. his philosophical activities were directed yeah. exclusively to medical. Yeah. Okay. And and in the guide, he has a huge section on why Jewish law is rational and reflects human nature. And he writes um, a, a book about a theory of ethics in which, you know, an Aristotelian theory of the mean, right? Um, between the two extremes. So um, he's totally devoted. It's He's totally devoted to the community. He's totally devoted in the trying to be in the model of the prophets who use reason in the interest of community. But he also has an ideal of, of the intellectual life, okay? So by prophecy, you know, he means acting as a leader of community, because like I was thinking, the age of prophecy ended with Ezra and Nehemiah, right? So that you can have philosophers, but no more prophets, right? Not in the Maimonidean sense, because in the Maimonidean sense, God is, the God of nature does not talk to someone, right? This is an imaginative model that, uh, this imaginative story that Moses made up to give authority. And that's a, why he couches it, because he's saying something about the authority of the text. Mm -hmm. And he's saying it's not like whispered by God into Moses's ear. It's Moses's imagination. He invented this thing. And he was a scientist, so he put truth in it. Mm -hmm. But he invented it. And Maimonides doesn't want, I've written about this actually, that the secret is that Maimonides doesn't want everybody to know that Maimonides wants everybody to understand it's rational, but he doesn't want everybody to know that it's invented, that it's conventional that, and that not whispered. Them. It can, destroys the divine authority. Mm -hmm. It's a symbol, symbolic mm -hmm. interesting thing, right? It, the metaphorical. Yeah. They said this is simple. This is metaphor, yeah. uh, and the me the language is metaphor. But he also comes at it from the other side. He he's happy to admit that reason will never give us complete knowledge of God. Absolutely. And that limitation, when you tell the public that you should be more rational, and they're like, but what's the point? I'm never going to get to the end anyways. Mm -hmm. Then they lose faith in the philosophical endeavor as well. So he has to be secretive about both sides and the limitations of both sides while keeping them kind of pointed at each other at all times. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that's very important because Maimonides has a supernal view of God and the distance between human beings and what we can accomplish and the divinity of God is is very extreme. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a topic of debate within Maimonides studies. Yeah. And I, as a Spinozist, push it more towards the rational end and many other people, the Kantian folks, push it towards the other end. I'm, I'm sorry, on my podcast, it's just, Rabbi saying that the whole point of the Torah is summed up by Moses when he said, when Moses tells the people, um, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Yeah. And by attaining, what you're saying then is that holiness is that upper level of cognizant right. knowing. And then Moses goes on to, you know, give the Ten Commandments, you know, revere your mother and your father, keep the Sabbath. You know, turn, don't turn idols, but don't turn to idols and make mighty gods. But first and foremost, the whole purpose of the Bible is to distinguish us from those who are not like you and say, you are holy because the Lord your God is holy. You are a holy people. You can become holy to the extent that one can become holy through scientific knowledge and that's not something about just jews that's a human characteristic and um <clears throat> the maimonides although maimonides would say 
they don't have access to the Bible the way we do, right? Uh, so um, he would uh, want everyone to be holy because after all, he's a philosopher and believes in the uh, commonness of human nature to everybody. So we were lucky to have Moses who gave us the Torah. Can I ask you a question about some of these mundane activities? Sure. Whoever. If he is seeing patients, blah, 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 he is participating in the community. In his view, that is actually not as holy, or is there necessary evil, or can it be flipped to say, this is also holy in itself, these activities, this engagement in the world, you know, kind of like Sisyphus pushing the rock. Oh, you up. have I mean, to do this, yeah. right? Because this is the you have to or can it be wrong? Well, well, but it, right. I don't think what I'm trying to get out short. Sure. Yeah. Okay, okay. I, yeah, all right. my point. Yeah, I see your point. Uh, okay. Knowledge gives us love. <laughs> Rules give us obedience. Is right? Knowledge gives us love of God. Rules give us obedience. We can't, we can't, by following the rules, That's correct. come to a, uh, a, right. a holiness, uh, it's kind of like a necessary evil. I, I wouldn't say evil, it's not necessary evil, it's just lesser. lesser, it's not, let's put it this way, necessary. you cannot, right, you have necessary beliefs, we could go there, necessary necessary but okay. we can all, um, right, we can only come to human fulfillment, human transformation, human psychological transformation and ecstatic love of God for knowledge. So you would, you would kind of not like Sisyphus and Camus that this engagement in the world is the best we could hope for and um, this is how we build meaning and no. he would not do that. No, 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 he, he's really ecstatic. I mean, he's, a ra he's also a rational mystic. Uh, because, why? Because you are communing with God's mind. You know, what is nature? Nature is the only expression that we have of God. And when we understand it, what's going on in our minds are the rules of the very nature of the universe, right? We begin to incorporate how the actual universe works and God created this universe. And that's trend, that's absolutely ecstatic. How long have been saying about how people interact with nature? Like, so... Right. Obviously, a big issue right now is right. how bond the world is right. their interactions right. through markets and how they impact nature. Right. And so we're constantly treating nature in that way. Right. And that, right. You know, so I actually wrote a paper on this. I wrote a paper on this um, comparing Kant's uh, anthropology versus Maimonides' anthropology and his, his uh, absolute uh, glory in nature that it is a different view of nature. It's not an instrumentalist view of nature because to know nature is to love nature. And that's of course where we get to with Spinoza, right? It goes straight into it. Maybe I push him a little too far, but it is not that, it is not the separation of the human person from the natural world it, because nature is glorious and it's the only place we can find God. And if that's the case, it has a different status. In fact, nature is more holy, if you want to use that word, for Maimonides than the Bible. It, yeah. I mean, it's a fascinating view, and it's so different from our American presupposition. Well, the whole study of anthropology is how people adapt to their environment, to nature, mm -hmm. how they live with nature. And it's that's the whole gist of it. It's not, you know, it's, it's how they yes. create things to live within nature. Yes. To, yes. And chief amongst which is religion itself. Yes. yes. And not only and that, language, right. and, humans, right. and, and human beings. And human beings interacting with nature in order to survive. Yes, so but, but one more point, and that is for Maimonides and even more so for Spinoza, the human person is a product of nature. The human person is natural mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. as divine as natural, right? So there isn't this, this gap between human and nature because nature is so supernal, so expression expressive of God, the human person is the best expression 
of nature and of God. And that means the mental as well as the physical. And for Spinoza, they're one. For Maimonides, he denigrate as an Aristotelian, he does denigrate uh, the body. No, 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 I wouldn't say that because on the one hand, we're part of it. But on the other hand, um, as we incorporate the laws of nature, we become identified, our minds become the whole of nature. And that's straight out of Aristotle de Anima. Uh, one, one thing I just want to say, you seem yeah. to be pushing towards the line of climate change and the dangers humans may pose to the planet. Uh, Maimonides is prevented from going that far because of an Aristotelian notion of the eternity of species. Mm. Uh, individuals may die, but species as a whole are eternal. They are just as lawful as the speed of light in a vacuum. Mm. So uh, the idea that we would kill out yeah. doesn't quite exist for us. Right. But their respect for it. Yeah, yeah, but we are caretakers, right? Yeah. Adam names right. all of these animals, gives yeah. them the rightful place, right. and we are caretakers, right? Yeah, but as human beings interact with one another. Yeah. And I don't know how much there is like discussion about like our interactions with other people in markets and how that impacts our climate and, and, and everything around us. And so just like the, the nature of living in nature and using resources to our own needs. Right, 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 exactly. And that's something I've talked about right. a long time. Because markets are natural too, right? They happen automatically. Yes, but not everything that's natural is good. Uh, I mean, so because they separate, you see, what's na natural is not necessarily, even though everything that is is natural and it's perfect, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily good for human people. Mm -hmm. And a human perspective is different. This is when we go to Spinoza, but mm -hmm. Maimonides too. The human perspective is not the divine perspective. After all, from the eternal perspective, uh, you know, you can't destroy the universe, presumably. We can destroy the planet. Uh, <clears throat> but for both Maimonides and Spinoza, ethics is the human perspective. What are we doing for us? Of course, Spinoza wants us ultimately, and actually Maimonides to some extent, to look at everything from the absolute <laughs> universal eternal perspective. But we also have to look at things from at least the earthly perspective. And that's where ethics comes in. Ethics is not about the universe. The ethics is about how do we live together uh, at peace and stability and decency. I guess my, I'm not that's sure right. if you're with language, but when you keep on saying us and we, we're part of nature. Yeah. And we um, probably act, I personally think this, yeah. but probably act in a, According to the rules of nature, our cognitions, yes. our thoughts, yes, are bound by the laws of physics and, and the like, and um, and, and, and psychology, and, yeah. yeah. But, um, so, is it really fair to have this kind of distinction? And I think that's what between means. nature and and human and human oh yes, yes, it's not an ultimate distinction. It's a useful distinction for the purposes of. The conventions of society. Everything we do is natural. I mean, from a Spinozistic standpoint, actually from a Maimonidean too, but Maimonidean is a little different because he's a dualist, whereas Spinoza is a monist. He's a dualist. Right, he's a dualist. Uh, it's to some extent, not not in an absolute Manichaean sense, but um, for Spinoza, everything can be described naturally, so it is always perfect. But it's not necessarily good because human, because for Maimonides and for Spinoza, good is what's good for us. Right, good is not the universe is neither good nor bad. In fact, Maimonides says this in the guide: the universe isn't good or bad. The universe is perfect. In fact, he may God isn't concerned with what's humanly good. And you see, he's very radical. He says that at some point: the God is not concerned with what's humanly good. God is concerned with nature and the perfect, which is of a scale, you know, way beyond us. We have to be concerned with the human society. Wow. How about the fact that humans, as a, as a general rule, are not real good at knowing a trick with them? Yes. <laughs> Put a devil dog in a yes, yes. Yes. On the, <laughs> the That's what the ethics is. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you. Yeah. Right, right. Together. Um, my uh, Spinoza writes, uh, you know, that's what the ethics is about. The ethics is the education of desire. And it's about how you get from, you know, short term 
<laughs> desires that you know will kill you tomorrow to uh, more recent desires. I mean, that's what Spinoza does in the ethics. And he thinks that you can get there through a universal viewpoint. In other words, how are you going to systematically, in fact, look at oneself, one's own motivations uh, in, in granular detail and begin to understand them as the, un as the universe acting in me. And then one's desire becomes, one was, once one sees oneself as sort of the, 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 the universe, you know, we're a tiny tail, mm -hmm. right? A tiny point in the whole universe playing itself out, then you want for the universe because that's the only me that's gonna survive. So that's how he gets there. But Maimonides is more mythic. But Spinoza says it doesn't work for most people because the problem is when you get sick or you get scared or, you know, life is short, guess what? We'll all want for yeah, non asparagus yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that's why you need um, social rules to get people to be more rational than they would be on an individual level. But it, the difference is that Maimonides thinks that educated people will do better, and Spinoza says, no, they won't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. How does it affect your dual life? You know, that's such a, oh, thank you for that question. Um, wow. We know what's holy. Yeah. Um, let's say how it's affected my teaching. Because last year, I, I mean, I've, I've always, I've taught Spinoza, for, you know, I've taught at Hamilton College for this is the 41st year. So I've always taught Spinoza and I teach the ethics, I teach the TTP. Um, but last year I said, okay, I'm not gonna just let this, you know, go into the world and you'll do with it what you will. Every week you're gonna take a principle and you're gonna live Spinoza for that week. And I wanna know what, how it felt and how it changed your feelings and your thinking and your acting every week. And you're gonna keep a journal. And I'm doing that for the second. And, and then the students at the end of the semester said, we wanna write a play about our, you know, how it changed us, mm -hmm. uh, scenes. And they said, we want t-shirts. So I had them design <laughs> t-shirts and they have WWSS, what would Spinoza say on the t-shirts? And they have, uh, they drew my cat uh, named after Spino Spinoza Bento. <laughs> and they have these wonderful pink t-shirts. And this year I'm doing it again. And, and then they seem to, they, I've read the first set of journals and most of them applied it to, um, sports, that it made them feel psychologically better to do sports. And that was about how the mind and body are one thing uh, expressed together. And I'm waiting to see what they'll do. Um, I, I think it's deeply affected me. Um, I call myself a spinozist, but, um, you know, it's an aspiration more than a... Mm -hmm. Question to follow up. So still sort of take away a little bit of your own volition. Yes, well, totally. Um, and uh, uh, deliberately so, right? Sort of. Deliberately so. Yeah, right, it does. So, I mean, for me... Yeah. Would it, I'm sorry, would it ever... It doesn't it? sort of take away your volition. It does. I mean, I mean, I want, misses it out, right? Right, right. So, I mean, one of the things, like, yeah. I'm not an expert by any means, but yeah, yeah. I read a little bit. And, um, you know, I always yeah. appreciate people like Sartre who say, you know, you yeah. can have... Meaning because yeah. you you create meaning. You create meaning with your volition and your right, choice. Right, and, right, right. Well, actually, you don't have volition or choice. Um, or there's no you to have volition or choice. And right. you know you do, do you do make choices that just not what we call free choices, right? Of course. right? I mean you, you we obviously yeah. make decisions and choices, but for Spinoza, you know, if you have the universe and it's really all one thing, and mm -hmm. the fact that you are this little dot in this endless you know connections of it's buddhist right endless connections of all things are in infinitely connected what you have is a conatus so what spinoza called conatus in other words you have desire you have desire for this but it's the it's the causes flowing through, through you yeah. but that you feel like me to feel like you but the yeah. what you have is the what i tell my students is what you have is the possibility of understanding more. And the more you understand, the more the, of those causes, the more they're inside you and not just outside you. 
So you're making decisions with more of that, but that's a gift. I mean, we're lucky to have education, to have read Spinoza, to live at this time, to have access sure. to medical care, you know, and- To have money around it in a particular so, way to be able to understand that. I, yeah, so you get, what you get is more agency. Okay, so think of it. No, I mean, let, let me, let's think of it. This is the example I would give my students, and that is, um, you know, vaccines. We, I mean, we have knowledge in the community of vaccines. We have more agency over our over our lives because of this. Because I have learned about vaccines, I go and get my COVID, my you know, my tenth COVID shot, and I have more agency than someone who didn't do that or who wasn't educated to do that. So we do have more agency. We don't have more free will. Okay, we have more power because knowledge gives us power. Let's say um, people long ago who couldn't uh, fly in airplanes, right? We have more agency because the community has that knowledge and we can get to Europe in five hours. One bit between agency and free will one more time. We, knowledge gives us power. Knowledge gives us power. Knowledge gives us power. In other words, um, I, right, I know rational things about the world and how it works. For example, I know, in a, I mean, even though I don't know very much about astronomy, I know that an eclipse is a natural event, whereas uh, people, you know, 5,000 years ago didn't know that and might have thought it was, you know, the gods are looking badly at us or something, right? Yeah. Um, I don't have very much agency over an eclipse, but I have agency over going to see the eclipse and understanding it, but I do have agency in part because I have agency over all kinds of things. Let me give you another silly example. Uh, I brush my teeth every night as everybody else does here. But, you know, uh, germ theory of disease, right? These things give us agency. Knowledge gives us power. I have another this small example. Good. When yeah. you look at a mountain, a huge one, yeah. Everest, you start to feel cold, exhausted, right? Uh, it's like daunting. Mm. You start worrying about how much money you're going to have to spend getting to the border and hiring a Sherpa. None of that has anything to do with the mountain. The mountain doesn't experience cold. The mountain doesn't deal with borders. You're thinking about a mountain, you're learning about yourself. So when you think about a mountain and you feel fear or you're already tired or you're worried you're going to get cold, you're only learning more about yourself. And so the entire process is a reflective process to understand what made you afraid of that mountain, right? Mm -hmm. Or let's say you climbed Kilimanjaro two weeks ago. When you look at Everest, you're not going to feel that cold anymore because you now know that you can survive those temperatures. You now know the advantages of Gore-Tex and down yeah. sleeping bags. <laughs> right. And how that affects the body. And so this illusioned imaginary fear, this mountain will be the death of me, <laughs> disappears. Because you understand mm -hmm. your role and how yeah. natural things affect you and place you in that what position. You're saying, was it just if neurons, your kind of cognition is along for the ride of neurons firing your brain? Yeah. Uh, right, no, no, I, not reductive. We don't have to be reductive. Be, knowledge is real. Knowledge is in our minds and it's real. And if for Spinoza and Maimonides, thoughts are real. I mean, they are real things. It's not just neurons, it's not epiphenomena mm -hmm. of neurons. They are, we really know things mm -hmm. and we learn things. But we're lucky to learn things. I mean, in a, in, that's that's the connection. You know, that's where we go. We're lucky we live now and understand the germ theory of disease and can deal with that. I mean, you know, many of us have medical conditions that we know how to deal with. I mean, we take medications, we take vitamins. Uh, we learned something about, like in upstate New York where I live, uh, we don't have any sun. You know, it's the it's the grayest place in the country, so I take vitamin D. Um, but that's that's. I have more agency over my life because of that. I am not saying free will, but you can choose yeah. to. I, I, I do not, choose I it. Understand okay. I, I need to dumb it's, this down to free okay. will. Okay. Like, it's, we it's, don't have to choose right. to right, right, go out your... Right. We are choosing. If you the, choose all the time, so is that not... No, the, the, the technically, free will is the notion that you cannot trace it back from that. I choose that because I know that because the society has, uh, because there have been um, scientific uh, uh, studies that showed something about vitamin D and you go back and back and back and back, you can trace um, those causes and those causes um, are not ones I invented. I didn't invent my myself. I learned things and 
if you trace me, you'll find that, you know, I had an American education. I grew up at a certain time. My father was a doctor. You know, every, I don't choose who I am. I, you cannot choose who you are so that um, it, you, it, it, right. you, you, you make so, choices that just not what we call in philosophy yeah. free in the sense of self invented. Yeah. But goals to realize you that your choice it? is at best one infinitesimal factor in a massive mm-hmm. determination. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but even but even that factor has its mm-hmm. own mm-hmm. causal yeah. chain yeah. heading yeah. back yeah. to eternity. Yeah. 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 At no yeah. point yeah. is there just a brute yeah. fact yeah. of yeah. I'm making a choice and nothing influenced that. Right, that I'm, I'm self-invented. It's the notion of hmm. I invented myself. I think free will is different in philosophy than it is in politics. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's it's a very technical. Yeah. It's the notion of you invent yourself and we don't invent ourselves. In fact, we're found objects. So I just want to add in a point where you, where, where do you fit in my class your class? We're all sitting here thinking that we have all the knowledge and our time is to progress and to build a whole world out there and get another view of time. And what is that for me? Alternative facts. Alternative facts, exactly. Viewpoints. Because someone else thinks that um, it's horrible to go back to land because maybe you might go on that first. You know, um, alternative facts about how the world is so you know, we think that their view is wrong, but they think it's right. And so where does that fit into the discussion? Right. I think you're um, looking at it as, as this is the great example of Moses as a politician who was able to pin feeling on the overall success of society, or people who read the movie back and think the world got half, or do this or do that, to forge a knuckle to confront the thing that has the common body to create what was overall positive for society. And therefore, you know, Moses or Hamilton or Lincoln who can wind through you know, the, the strands and the passions and whatever else it is to create a more societal good. It's not going to be perfect, but it's progress and it's a net result. And therefore, right. the philosopher now is empowering our friends to be dumb in the back. Of the <laughs> I carry that offense with pride. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the hero in this scenario is the person who can you know, educate, and that's strange. I mean, I think it's hard to tell rather than the, the monk who right. can Absolutely. But educating yeah. students or alternatively educating the community to yeah. bring us all forward and applying that practical knowledge. Of what Science in the public interest mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. Maimonides. Um, sorry? Maybe we have Taylor Swift. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, but let me answer this question because for both Maimonides and Spinoza, there is a reality. Uh, for Spinoza, because it's embodied, in other words, one thing is not as good for you as something else. You believe that um, uh, vaccines are not good for you and someone believes that they are good for you. Guess what? We can play that out. So they're not they're not relativists. Neither of them is a relativist. Okay, they believe in the conventionality of um, of moral terms uh, in the sense that people invent them. And but there but there is a good that they can aim at. In other words, there's peace. Uh, 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 justice in terms of uh, a stability of a society, democracy for Spinoza. So um, these things are not, uh, they're not relativists. Uh, they do not think that, uh, they do not think that everybody's opinion is equal. Right, but around this, you know, we just have this discussion about agency. Yeah. So if you use alternative facts, yeah. that gives you a it gives you an agency. In yeah. fact, it, it it makes you, uh, it it it, and in fact, Spinoza has a theory of that. Part of his book is dealt deals exactly with that e- issue and what makes you weaker and what makes you stronger, and what makes knowledge makes you stronger in the world, and uh, and falsity right. and lies right. and self just it's about well, self. The, the, the idea of incorrect knowledge is a contradiction in terms these guys would never tolerate. Right, absolutely. And in fact, Spinoza's whole thing is self-deception. Self-deception makes you weaker, okay? That's the issue, and that's why honesty yeah. is empowering, even if it makes you miserable first. <laughs> and I think where the imperfection of language oh, yeah. really messes us up, and, yeah. and what I was saying before about the technology and how information is being, tra- yeah. is being transmitted, now yeah. with the acceleration yeah. and the, in, the inefficiency of it, 
Yeah. More room for error. Right. More room for error, but also so the need for uh, need for cultural means for getting together and understanding it and making some norms about it. I want to thank everyone for coming. I want to encourage them to come tonight. They can send you the discussion. The services are starting now. If people want to go to services, it's time you can go down. And we'll just put things in the table. Yeah. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I wanted to say, yeah, that's a good question.